So good morning. <laughs> so my name is Amy Cable. I'm the Executive Director of um, Student Services at the Louisiana Community and Technical College System. And this morning, I'm going to talk about um, kind of lots of different funding mechanisms that Louisiana has um, utilized to reskilling the individuals who live and work in Louisiana. So who is LCTCS? Uh, we are a management board for 12 community and technical colleges in Louisiana, and our mission is to identify and meet educational and workforce needs of our community through innovative, accessible, and dynamic programs. We are open admissions and offer multiple pathways for students to achieve degrees, technical diplomas, certificates, non-credit um, completion, and high school equivalency. In 2020, we served over 145,000 students, um, 81,000 credit, 22,000 adult education, and 41,000 workforce students. Um, and 5% of our population um, serves the Hispanic community. We had a record graduating class in um, 2020. So in 2014, we had about 19,000 graduates. And in 2020, we uh, graduated over 33,000 students, um, encompassing a significant growth in short-term credentials and certificates um, to 15,000. Um, our 2020 class also comprised a 7% increase in minority students graduating. <laughs> All right, so um, what is our student? What do we look like here in Louisiana? So we have traditional age students, but it's our average age is about 27, 39% um, African American and 60% female and 54% of our students attend part time. We also have a, a large workforce development training arm where the average age is 34 and we have lots of different programs, but the primary programs are construction and maritime are the most popular ones. And then for adult basic education, our average age is 32, 47% uh, African American, 18% Hispanic, and 54% female. So our average student is really someone who is going to be working full time, they may have dependents, they have the education as one of their priorities, and they really want a better life, and LCTCS really helps to provide that that service to help students uh, achieve that. So why does Louisiana need a skilled workforce and why do we need the funding to do that? Number one, because we have thousands of uh, jobs in Louisiana that require some type of education beyond a high school. Um, there are limited resources uh, for workforce training. So most students who are going to enter our college may go into the credit side of the house where maybe they have federal financial aid that helps support that. But workforce training it largely is paid for either by an employer or maybe that individual student paying out of pocket. And so in order to better help fund that, we need some funding mechanisms um, either through the state or at the federal level. Um, our adults, as we have seen in the previous slide, are working adults. They have dependents, and so they need short-term training that can get them to a job fairly quickly so that they can enter the workforce and hopefully you know, increase their earnings and uh, their lifestyle. So LCTCS has uh, ventured into a lot of different uh, pilots to fund short-term uh, or workforce training. So prior to 2020, um, we actually had several different pilots where we funded either through the state or through our own individual um, resources, non-credit training for adult students. And so those initiatives and pilots really helped lay the groundwork for a couple of other uh, programs that we're going to talk about here in a little bit. So Reboot Your Career is one of the uh, the most recent and um, probably one of the most successful programs that we uh, that we've launched. So, um, the Reboot Your Career was developed um, with public and private data partners to determine high uh, high demand occupations, and we were able to track and monitor quarterly race, gender, and industry and occupation. Um, and then we created a robust dashboard using Power BI to track um, diversity, equity, and inclusion in all of these service areas. So Reboot Your Career was established in a very short time frame um, within about three months in response to the COVID-19 um, impact. Um, and it was a $10 million investment by our governor 
um, through the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund. And that initiative basically helped to train almost 6,000 individuals in Louisiana. Uh, we administered the program for our 12 community colleges in, additional, in, in addition to the two other community colleges in the state. Um, and we are continuing this funding until 2022 uh, here in the next couple of months. And we've actually, our colleges have actually exceeded the number of credentials with the funding that we actually have available to them. So some of our colleges are gonna be funding this out of their own pocket. Um, and, and it was just a really great opportunity for our colleges to get together and really learn more, I think, about what our business and industry needs and then the needs of our students that we serve. They wanted something that was really quick and that could put them to work that really aligned with, um, you know, the business and industry and the needs of our state. So the different jobs and credentials that were funded by Reboot. Um, so there were no minimal minimum educational requirements. So if someone didn't have a high school diploma, they could still attend any of these classes. Uh, but they wanted the classes that were short term. So something that could happen between 12 and 16 weeks or less. So we didn't want something that really aligned to the traditional, you know, credits out of the house or a community college, like associate degree. We wanted something really, really quick that we could put people to work. Um, we also know that job growth changes every year and I mean sometimes job growth, especially in today's time is changing constantly. And so we really wanted to align that job growth with the credentials that we were offering as well. Um, we also wanted to make sure that these were high wage, high demand jobs. So we didn't want, you know, uh, I always use basket weaving as my, as my classic example, but we didn't want a short term credential in basket weaving because that really doesn't align with the high wage, high demand um, job opportunities in our state. And then we wanted to make sure that training for jobs in sectors of the economy in significant recession were excluded. So maybe there was a large infiltration of certain different types of jobs and we didn't really, but there wasn't a need for that. We didn't really want to make, uh, you know, offer credentials in those particular areas. And then we used a lot of data. So we used our Louisiana workforce data. We used a EMSI data and job postings. We uh, received uh, in input from private sectors in the business and industry. And then, of course, we worked with our college partners as well to identify which offerings that they had at their campus, what was high demand for them, and then we aligned that with you know, the business and industry in the state. So because we used all of this data and we used all of these partnerships, we identified I identified five industry sectors um, that we were going to align our reboot credentials with. Again, we didn't want basket weaving or something that was kind of obscure. We really wanted to make sure that we had programs that aligned with the jobs that were needed in the state. Um, and so there were five industry sectors, so healthcare, information technology, and then transportation and logistics. And then you can see from this slide here that and, you know, depending on the area, these were the jobs that you could, you know, receive once you receive the credential. So for transportation and logistics, you were looking for maybe crane and tower operators. And then our credentials were aligning to those different positions. And then we also had manufacturing and construction as well. So as I mentioned before, we graduated over 6,000 students. So as of 630 uh, 2021, we had 5,200 credentials earned. Um, but now we've exceeded that number by almost 1,000. Um, and so again, we, and we've exceeded all of our money. So we had a $10 million investment. We far exceeded that number. And so our colleges are putting up their own resources to try to help uh, you know, ensure that those students receive those credentials. Um, and then you can just see the breakout for um, how the jobs align with the different industry sectors. So you can see that the, the blue one of uh, transportation um, you know, was probably one of the largest ones in the state. And then this just outlines um, the different the different demographics for the reboot program. So you can see that you know the large majority, of course, was male, um, and that really does align with those industry sectors, which I think is a challenge that we need to you know we need to better understand in our state. And then how do we you know create opportunities for females to go into male dominated fields? 
And then you can also see the race of our participants um, here as well. Can I ask a question? How does that demographic, uh, ethnicity wise, match with the whole state? Um, so, last night, I can't remember. So, our, our college system as a whole serves about 5% of the Hispanic population, but I'm not sure the, the whole state demographic okay. specifically, which you might know. 4%. 4%. Gotcha. Thank you. She's my co worker. She's my co worker. She helped develop a lot of this. So, <laughs> so uh, we, of course, this was a huge program for our colleges to, to launch and to implement. Um, but we learned a lot of lessons throughout this whole process. So, um, we learned some systematic lessons and a couple that I would like to highlight is one is that non credit workforce training comes in many shapes and sizes and has historically maintained significant flexibility in program and design. And so that is the beauty of a workforce non credit program is that it is very flexible, you can have an industry partner call you tomorrow and say I want you to do a six week class and you can just launch it. The challenge with that, though, is that when you have money tied to a program like that, that increases the amount of data reporting that is happening. And then because that data is needed, you have to kind of rethink how you collect that data and what data you know, source do you use, where do you input that data so it's consistent for 12 institutions. And so that collecting of the data can be a little bit more of a challenge because you know you don't traditionally maybe ask for social security number or date of birth for a workforce student but you need that for tracking purposes you know long term um, the vast majority of, of in-demand jobs are in demand statewide with a minimal regional variance across these five industry sectors so we just saw that those five industry sectors were very prevalent across our entire state i'll mention that there are some industry sectors that are considered high wage high demand in certain parts of the state but they didn't make it to this list so think about hospitality hospitality in certain areas are very prevalent specifically in like the new orleans region but it might be high wage high demand in that region but it is not largely that way across the state and then lastly, creative partnerships and braided funding as possible with more communication and coordination. So one of the things that we really wanted to make sure of is that any student who came to our college had an opportunity to receive funding to go to school um, and to receive a credential. And so it really broadened our scope in the different funding mechanisms that we can think about. On the credit side of the house, we traditionally think about the federal Pell Grant or the federal student loan program. On workforce, you're traditionally thinking about a company paying for you know, an individual's training. And so the idea behind Reboot and our other funding mechanism that I'll talk about later is really just expanding that scope and knowing that we really do have a lot of untapped resources in our state that we really have to figure out how to use them collectively together so that students aren't having you know, to take out student loans or just not getting the credential because they can't you know, afford it. So from a student-centered approach, a couple of lessons learned is that financial barriers and time are the primary obstacles. Again, that is why we need very short-term credentials and we need funding tied to those credentials. Um, so that is one of the most important things that I think that we've learned in all of this is so how do you create programs with funding structure that helps that individual student who might be facing that barrier? Um, obstacles to enrollment and retention still extend beyond time and money. So while we may be able to answer a student's individual needs with how to pay for college or how to pay for a credential or even how to fit it within the context of their life, of their lifestyle. So we can do online, we could do hybrid, we could do six weeks, eight weeks. It still doesn't answer the question, how do you pay for childcare? How do you pay for transportation? What about books and supplies? What if you need food? So it's again, other obstacles that we have to kind of think about for a student. And then also balancing that with how do you be all things to all students? Um, and that can be a challenge for a college, especially you know in the time that we're in right now, when you have you know, less employees at our institution, we're also kind of struggling with enrollment. So it's really a, a balancing act. And then students may struggle to find information about non-credit courses. So um, traditionally in our Louisiana 
you know, colleges, it's very siloed. You've got workforce over here. You've got, you know, credit over on this other side. And we do a very good job at probably navigating students through the credit side of the house. If you want an associate's degree, there's a big an apply now. There's a program of study listed on the college website. It's not the best navigation, but it's probably a little bit easier. With workforce, it's a little bit different because everybody calls workforce something different. They call it non-credit, they call it workforce, workforce solutions, workforce training. So, and then I think there's this, are you are you working with a business and industry or are you offering a credential to someone like me, right? So I'm a, an everyday individual who just wants to get a credential so that maybe I can earn some more money later on. And so really trying to navigate that with the students, help them understand all of the different programs that a college offers and also connecting those jobs with the different career or those programs the different career pathways that a student can enter so think of someone who maybe wants to go into nursing for example on the credit side of the house well nursing we know is very competitive we have limited spots so why not you know bridge that gap on the non-credit side of the house maybe have that student get a very short-term credential like phlebotomy or x-ray tech something something like that and then you're keeping that student engaged until that nursing program opens up for maybe the next semester so again just kind of rethinking how we offer education I, I think is something that's really important that we should all kind of learn from and i think even the non-credit side of the house has a lot of advantages because it's short term it's very agile it's flexible you can do things a little bit easier than you can on the credit side because maybe there's not as many um, barriers like with SACS accreditation and things of that nature. So we can learn some things from the workforce side of the house, but on the credit side, you can learn more because it's it's really about data reporting and tracking mechanisms and really creating those connections with students. All right. So then the college related lessons that we've learned. Um, is that colleges typically train in programs with established track record and faculty. And so branching into different programs can be uh, very difficult. So think about IT. Um, I think too, we tend to just kind of operate on a rolling schedule. We just take, this is what we've always offered. And this is what we're gonna offer the very next semester. And so really working with business and industry and across those different industry sectors, we have to be able to answer what they need. And so if they're telling us that we need need a CompTIA, you know, credential for IT, we need to have a college that's going to offer that particular program and answer that need. We can't, it can't go unnoticed by an institution because they don't have a faculty member. But that's the reason you branch out to those business and industry sectors is because maybe they have someone that the college could credential and then they could bring them in to teach the course. Um, another big lesson, I think, is just the systemization of data collection and reporting. Um, that is a gap that, that needs to be addressed. So, like I mentioned before, data reporting for workforce traditionally was done in another system, and then our credit data was in another system, and we're kind of, you know, piecemealing all of this together, and now we've moved to a place where all of our data, both workforce and credit, non-credit and credit, are all in one data instance. That is a challenge for workforce again because it's a different it's new it's different they're trying to kind of learn the whole purpose around this but i think anytime you're having funding associated to a program you have to be able to have really good quality data collection and it's got to be quality data we and we don't want to have gaps in that information and then long term you want to be able to really show that someone came to your college received a credential and then they were able to go to work and you want to be able to track that wage and earnings across you know through time you can't do that if you don't have certain pieces of information and so um, i think that's really it's a challenge but it's something that we're definitely working towards <clears throat> so we talked a lot about reboot your career and it's really laid the groundwork for another program that we that we're um, launching uh, this year june or July of 2022, and it's called the MJ Foster Promise Program. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more about that program. But just to show on this slide in particular is that all of the different funding initiatives and pilots that we've had have laid groundwork for more money in this space. So we've got the initiatives that we did prior to Reboot, we have a $10 million investment through Reboot where we have you know, data-driven results. We have lots of evidence that this works. 
We have an NJ Promise program that is being launched this year that is around the same idea, five industry sectors, putting people to work. Um, and that's going to lay the groundwork for other funding opportunities like Justice Health, for example. So how do you tie, you know, an NJ Foster Promise program with the Pell funding that someone could get if they, you know, were previously or currently incarcerated? And then Federal Pell Grant for short-term workforce training. Every year we've been seeing in the legislature that that keeps coming up and it kind of falls back. It's back again right now. And so, again, we're providing that evidence-based information to support all of these different types of programs. So our MJ Foster Promise Program, so it's a, it's a promise program that Louisiana is launching in July of 2022. Uh, we started all of the work last year, it was signed into law, and we're Basically, right now, we're gearing up for this. We have a huge marketing campaign that will launch February of 22. Um, our application will launch in March uh, with first round of funding going out in July for students. Um, it's another $10 million investment, and it's, by the, it's funded by the state. Um, and it's going to provide tuition um, or financial aid for tuition and fees for three years at a Louisiana public two-year post-secondary institution. Um, and it can be for, used for both credit and non-credit credentials, which is great. Um, and again, they're aligned to high wage, high demand jobs, and it's really going to set forth, you know, that, that opportunity for colleges to create more robust pathways between the different areas. So who will qualify for the MJ Foster Promise Program? It's for Louisiana res residents 21 years and age and older. So for a little bit of context, Louisiana has a state scholarship program for high school graduates, and it's called the TOPS program. And so that program is really for the 18-year-old who's going to graduate. They're going to receive it. There's multiple levels. Um, so the in individual could go to a community college or they could go to a four-year institution and they can use that to pay for tuition. Um, we wanted something to help adult students. So again, we have we have provided evidence that we are an institution or a system that really serves the adult population. And we know that workforce is really serving that adult population and there is a lack of funding there. And so we really wanted to have a program that supported that uh, group of students. Um, it is not merit-based, so there's no GPA or ACT requirement. There is an income requirement, though, so it's based on 300% of the federal poverty level or six months underemployed or unemployed. Um, there is no high school graduation requirement, but there is going to be a co-enrollment um, with adult basic education. So the great thing about that, again, is we're really tapping into that adult population and really rethinking how we serve, you know, the individuals in our state. There is an attestation that the student has to complete, basically saying that they will remain in Louisiana for at least two years and then can uh, perform 20 hours of community service. And then uh, former nonviolent offenders uh, who are, um, are also eligible as well. So the financial aid application is required so that we can get collect that income information. Um, it is a last dollar in award, essentially meaning that if someone were to apply for a Pell Grant, for example, um, on the credit side of the house, they could only get whatever the Pell Grant doesn't cover. But for a non-credit program that is not eligible for Pell, this can pay for the full freight of that program up to $3,200 um, for the year. It is for tuition and fees only. Um, so no no books and supplies or anything like that. But again, when we talked earlier about graded funding, this is an opportunity to really tap into what are other funding mechanisms out there that can help a student with those other needs outside of tuition and fees. So if they need transportation, books and supplies, what other funding is out there? Um, again, it's $3,200 annually for academic program and a $6,400 lifetime maximum award. Um, it is capped at 10.5 uh, $10 million dollars. And then I'll also mention in our most recent budget, uh, governor's budget, we had there's a line item for additional promise money and up in the form of $10 million. And we also have an additional reboot money as well. So again, I think our state is really seeing kind of um, the, the great impact that we've had. And so they're willing to fund this, which is which is really huge, especially because this has not always been the case in our state. 
Um, so just a couple of principles that we'll follow to implement the MJ Promise program. Again, it's really strengthening those partnerships across our system. We had lots of conversations with individuals that we traditionally don't have conversations with. And they, um, or maybe we've had them, but they weren't as robust um, or as strong. And now we really do have a strong partnership with different areas, uh, which I think is really great. Um, it's going to create some more integration of academic and workforce teams across of our colleges. So as I mentioned before, we we're kind of very much siloed and programs in, of this nature really forces those two areas to really work and talk to each other. Um, and because you want to build those pathways between those different programs. Um, and of course, I think most last but probably most importantly, is just that improved data collection that is required. So when you have money again, there's data requirements, but I think it will help to really tell a bigger story about kind of the work that we're doing in the state and how it's really impacting the individuals of Louisiana. So this is just a, a little bit about our, um, our partners. So we have education and training providers, which are our 12 community colleges. And then we'll also, this also extends to a couple of other community colleges that are outside of our system. Um, it includes our legislature, our governor, different employers, the workforce ecosystem, the planning council. Again, just a lot of different partners that we had in the state that's gonna make this program really successful. And then this is just going to continue to strengthen our workforce system. So internally, it really kind of forces our divisions to really talk with each other. Um, and it hopefully is going to align the services that we offer to students to all students. So rather than saying I'm workforce or academic, you're saying I am community college A and I serve all the students at this college. And when they leave here, they are going to get a credential. And that credential could come in the form of an industry-based certificate that's done on non-credit, or it could be an associate's degree that is offered on the credit side of the house. And so, to, and then you're also extending those student services. So if someone in workforce needs tutoring, they should be able to go to the same tutoring department that everybody else on your campus goes to. Um, and then I think it also just provides a sense that the student is the student and is very student focused, not college focused. And so the student is the most important person in all of this. And then again, it's strengthening, strengthening our partnerships um, externally with like our workforce development boards, um, our employers. We definitely want to make sure that we have credentials that are leading to jobs. So we need to make sure that we're having really robust conversations with employers so that they will actually hire you know, our graduates. Um, so again, it's just a lot of collaboration in the state, probably unlike we've ever seen before. So before we um, go to questions, um, I'd like to just take a moment. Um, this is my friend and colleague, dear um, Dr. Renee Cintron. He was supposed to be here with me today presenting, but unfortunately he passed away. Um, but he was a HETS board member since 2019. And he just had an incredible passion for education. And he helped lay the groundwork for the Promise Program, the Reboot Program, and just really had a very cohesive team at the system office that I work at. Um, and he really um, worked hard to create opportunities and equity and inclusion and to provide a pathway for success as many as possible. Um, he is a native of Puerto Rico. His mom still lives here. And so it's just been my honor to be here um, with you guys this week and, um, you know, representing him. So sorry, I'm getting a little emotional. <laughs> um, but I could not do this presentation, you know, without him and his support. Um, I'll also just thank my two colleagues that also traveled uh, from Louisiana. So Camille Conaway actually helped uh, create a lot of the framework for the reboot program. Um, and MJ Promise, we worked <laughs> into the night, burning the midnight oil, developing, you know, the law around that. And then Erin Landry. Um, leads our adult education program and and so she's she's just phenomenal too and is a part of our um a part of our little group that, that we work with so uh thank you guys for coming and seeing me today and thank you guys for you know joining our presentation and so now I'll open questions about the, the uh, data collection so uh on the academic side, the credit side, I would guess you're doing 
like an IRB for a data collection? Do you do that for the workforce side? I'm just curious. Like a institutional uh, review board? Uh, no, because so our system, for our system data, we're centrally, um, we're centrally managed. So we have access to all of the data for all of our institutions. So that's how we're pulling the data. Now we'll have data sharing agreements and MOUs with like the state um, and any of the any of the agencies that we need to partner with for data collection. We report our data up to the Board of Regents. And then so our IR department will work really hand in hand with the Board of Regents to collect all of the data that we need. Um, and then on the application for some of the programs, particularly the Promise program, there is essentially the student is providing permission to share that information with those state entities. Just another question. Are there any um, expectations on the workforce, workforce side that they will seek a job in that area? That is, that, is, that is the goal. That is the, that is but the nothing goal. written, like you. Um, I don't think there's anything written specifically, but again, I think that's where the partnerships really come into play. We have noticed that there are individual students who go, who do complete a credential and in, in, in receive an industry-based credential, but then they're not working in that sector where by which they receive the industry-based certificate. So I think that that's a challenge that we have to work on. So how do we build those partnerships with employers so that we really you know, create that seamless pathway for students? How do you involve career services? You know, again, career services, traditionally for the credit side of the house, not for non-credit. So they're very tapped in and in tune to what's happening with an employer mm -hmm. in our state. So how do you build that bridge? So I think there's some work that we'll have to do in that space um, because we can't, can't really know that for sure right now. And I think it's also about, you know, barriers to employment. You know, how does someone get into that employer, you know, pipeline? Or that, I think that's something that, you know, we have to help the student navigate that, especially, you know, if they've never come to college before. I think you had a question. Yeah, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, make the first one. Um, I may have missed your point on that. In one of your data training certificate, those certificate is your institution internally generated or it is aligned with some external? It's, it's usually aligned with some external entity. Um, oh. that, and so there, so in certain cases, the college is the credentialing body, depending on the course. Uh, but in other cases, it's actually a third party that's actually going to do the credential. So the college is providing the coursework, and then the student would go to the third party to receive the actual industry-based certificate. But they can't get the certificate if the college doesn't teach that material in, in, a, in, a, in a great way, I guess you could say. Now, some of our colleges' credential Think about welding. Our welding instructors are credentialed by the college, and so they can certify that the student's gone through the welding program and, and is a qualified welder, so that that college then provides a certificate and certifies a certificate for that particular student. So it depends on the industry sector and the, the credential that the student's receiving. Uh, the, the, the other question is uh, along data collection. Um, how or are you doing data collection after they exit your training program? Mm -hmm. How will they make a career advancement or mm -hmm. you know, uh, switch into a new kind of a career path? Do you, do you track that? Um, well, that's, that's the goal that we're trying to track, yes. So I think at our... I think at our institutions today, we're very good at tracking the credit data. It's a non-credit data that we're trying to track a little bit better. Um, and the partnerships that we have with those different um, state entities will help ensure that we're actually being able to track the student along the way. Because right now we don't, we have wage data, but we're not able to know that, you know, Camille completed this credential, went to this employer, and then we're able to really track her, say, five years from now. That's something that we're, we're we haven't traditionally done and we would like to be able to do. The reboot and the NJ Promise program is providing that pathway to do that because that's something that the state is going to be able to track. Um, I, I will try to think about what you described. 
if that um, trainee uh, after the train, training period work in private sector, mm -hmm. is that individual obliged to provide further data to state entity? If you are mainly collaborating with the state, state yeah. entity, but you know, in the private sector, how well, how collaborative yeah. they are working with state entity. Can the we can ask our, so our, our if they're in the UI wage data system, we can track them. That's how that's how you do it. So if they're employed full time in the private sector, they're being paid unemployment, you know, insurance, they're it ties back to their social security number. Mm -hmm. We can see five years from now, 10 years from now. Now, if they're in the gig economy or somewhere else that they wouldn't be in the unemployment insurance wage data system, then we won't know. But the entire private sector mm -hmm. is in the UI system for full time employees. Uh, let's see that that system again. What's unemployment that? insurance. It's through your state labor, your oh. state labor department. They, so every private employer is paying unemployment insurance on every full-time worker in the state. So if we know that worker's social security number and an employer is paying into the UI system on their behalf, then we know the wages that they're making, even many years down the road. Oh, that's interesting. As and that's long as they're part of a full-time employer um, and they're consistently working, then we can, we can with data sharing agreements with that state agency, we can you know, track it over time. And that's a challenge with like our non-credit is they traditionally don't collect the demographic social, social date yeah. of birth. We so we have to be able to collect that so that we can track you know, long term. Um, we're getting to that point because now we have one single data system that all data is going into, whether it's credit or non-credit. And so, and as a part of so like the admissions application for a non-credit student, they need to supply that information, like their social security number and date of birth, so that we can actually tell a, I would say a truer story of like the population that we're serving. Because right now we have large data gaps um, in race and gender and age um, on the non-credit side of the house. Um, sorry, if I may ask one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for your area, um, how many full-time personnel, manpower, uh, involved with supporting this? Uh, so at this, so I work at a board office and we have a team of about five individuals who work in education and training. So we're, our department is really supporting the institutions. Then we have 12 community colleges who have a, a workforce or non-credit department and that department it's going to vary by institution because we have one institution that's very large, and then we have a couple, we have some very small institutions. But I would say, large in part, they're small two and three man shops. Um, and then you, and you may have some, like one person is really working with business and industry partners, and then you have one who's really working with, um, you know, just the traditional student who wants to come to college to receive a credential. And we'll go here and then we'll do you. So, in a related, on a related note, um, how are you working with the colleges? Because you, you spoke earlier about uh, kind of changing the way people look at non, you know, a credential, you know, as opposed to academic. You know, I'm in marketing and communications, working for a community college, and it's it's like you said, it's academics and then workforce development. How are you working with the colleges and your system? so that they somehow elevate it, you know, the, the idea of workforce development in the marketing and communication so that there is a stronger presence like on the website and things yeah. like that. that. That's probably a work in progress. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it depends on, I would say who drinks our Kool-Aid, you know, we've got <laughs> some of our colleges who just like go right in, change their entire website to really kind of mimic the credit side of the house, which I think is really great. Um, I think our marketing department, particularly in light of the MJ Promise program, has started to really market the program, not MJ Foster, but the program of study. So really highlighting just manufacturing. Like you can come to our college and go into manufacturing. Well, manufacturing could be a two-year degree, could be a one-day class. So really changing, I guess, the way that we promote 
programs is instead of saying credit, non-credit, it's just we're promoting this whole entire sector. Mm -hmm. And if you come into manufacturing, you can get a multitude of certificates. So that's one way I think that we're trying to accommodate, you know, accommodate right. that. Yeah. So for the Promise program, our marketing department is basically deploying all marketing material to the institution. So they're going to get a toolbox with all of the marketing campaigns, the website, the videos, the social media, all of that. And then the college can then take that and they can do their own website that mimics our website. So we're trying to make it a lot more cohesive than we have in the past. Yeah, great. So the state budget that you are getting for these programs, they are mainly for the student support, right? Yes. They are not to support any new credential development by these colleges or universities? I mean, th could they create a new credential? Yes, I think there, there is opportunity for to do that, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you're working again with those business and industry partners and they're telling you they need you to offer a credential, then it's our it's on our onus to do that for you know for that business and industry. So we definitely we can definitely create new programs, but for these particular programs, they just have to be within those five industry sectors. So you couldn't just go develop understand. Yeah, yeah. a new program that's outside of those. Yeah, I mean, you could, you just wouldn't have funding for it. Correct. You do not have funding for it. You have to do your own. So so one thing I would say is in the non-credit space, some of the programs may be four or six weeks long, but they're getting the college is getting reimbursed for tuition that exceeds the cost of the program, right? And then there are other programs that are longer and more expensive. There does tend to be a pool of resources that the college has above and beyond this, what is needed for the student that they can use to try to do some of that development. Recruit a faculty member, pay a, pay a um, industry person a salary supplement to come in. So just, it is for the student support, but by definition, some of the shorter lower cost programs give the colleges some buffer that they can use to go out and try to develop some of those new credentials. Right, right, because this is something in the new areas like, you know, data analytics yeah. and things like that, uh, the capacity at the college level is yes. needed, and uh, then it's their own investment, it is. but based on the fact that you are supporting the students, so therefore they will come, then I should invest. Yes, in exactly. New yes, yeah. it's a long-term investment. And I think, too, another thing that we do in the state or at our office, with us in particular, you know, we're trying to tap into every funding source possible. So if there's a funding source through the Department of Children and Family Services that will support tuition and fees, we're tapping into that. Mm -hmm. And so, and we're constantly trying to think about how we scale this out, um, you know, to our other institutions to make it easy for our colleges to tap into that funding mm -hmm. source. Because the more money you can get, <laughs> hopefully you're able to use existing money, this new money, so that you can develop new programs along the way as well. Yeah, so you have these MOUs with uh, business and, and uh, you know, fostering the partnership with businesses and industry. So have, has that, have conversations progressed to perhaps creating on the business side, the concept of corporate quality universities? Yes, so okay. we're actually venturing <laughs> down this path right now with a corporate college initiative in, in the northern part of our state with four of our colleges uh, with great input, a lot of input from business and industry. And the idea is that, you know, we have four community colleges doing workforce training all in the same region with some of the same industry sectors. And so it's kind of like we need to rethink that because it would make more sense to have one centrally located because then you, and the other issue is that you have colleges that cross over county, we call them parishes, but parish lines. So then depending on where that industry partner sits, they could be working with one college one day and one college another. And so we really don't want that. We want one central place that in, uh, you know, the business and industry can come to. So it's definitely something we're working on. And maybe we'll talk about that the next time yeah. we present. It's a whole different ball game. Yeah, so, yeah, it really does. Yeah. And it's also a, a growth ball game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Great. Do you have any questions in the chat? Mm -hmm. Great questions. I appreciate it. This is really good conversation. Thank you. Thank you.